Okay. <clears throat> Back to this beast. Well, um, did some hours of operation on this thing, meaning it, it just ran it. I had buttoned it up in the case or cabinet, and uh, it, it worked okay for a while. But then some other troubles with it uh, became apparent. Um, the first thing I noticed was uh, a bit of hum, you know, 60 hertz, 120 hertz hum, uh, which pretty much turned out to be this electrolytic. Um, I measured, but it's a two-section electrolytic. It's supposed to be, it's marked 16 to 20 microfarad, uh, 150 volts, I think. Um, I think I measured 10 on one and something like 6 on the other. Uh, not a complete fail, but a little, a little more than uh, this uh, radio is willing to deal with and me as well. So uh, I left it in there for two reasons. One, someone down the line might want to see what was in there. Uh, it also happens to provide a convenient mounting place for the two smaller electrolytics I uh, installed here. Uh, those are these. Oh, <clears throat> doubt if this will focus enough, but they're spray atoms, uh, 30 microfarad, 150 volts. Uh, these were made in 1989. I've got some as old as 79. They're they're new, old stock, um, and every single one of them works just fine. If you can get your hands on a bag full of these, do. Uh, just about all of these uh, AA5 radios, if the electrolytics in it uh, go south, put some of these in. It's not critical. If it calls for 50, use 30. If it calls for 20, use 30. Don't worry about it. Uh, 150 volts is plenty for one of these hot, hot radios. Uh, so, uh, that's what I did there. It's maybe a little difficult to see. You obviously, you can see one here. There's another one behind it uh, from your view and I just pulled the wires directly off of the terminals of this guy and just moved them over here real real simple it probably little operation probably took 10 minutes so that took care of the, the hum problem uh, but there was another problem that I uh, it, that showed up um, it wasn't a big one but it was noticeable and that was a, a, a occasional sort of uh, staticky, hashy noise coming out of the speaker. Now, uh, previous videos, I have already replaced the capacitors in this IF can, this transformer. Um, that made a world of difference. Um, and I had it previously gone through and replaced a number of, of paper and wax, beeswax capacitors that. Um, uh, just usually as a matter of course just get rid of them because they're nothing but trouble um, but uh, there were some other issues with it uh, as I said noise was coming through so uh, the first place I went was this first IF can again the, the one I repaired restored is the second IF um, the first IF can that it turns out is a replacement part uh, so, a, uh, a technician's been into this radio with repairs before and, and, and had replaced this can. Probably, in fact, most likely uh, for the same reason that this, this one had failed. These mica capacitors that they have integral in the, in, in the basis of these things fail. Um, this one here, there's the capacitor. The problem with this one was again leakage between this this capacitor and this capacitor, all on the same mica sheet, um, causing major troubles. Uh, so I decided to go ahead and restore this can, and being the replacement, it's it was different. Um, here's the you can see the relative size of these two wafers. And what difference I noticed with this one, this replacement can one, 
is that the two capacitors are uh, further separated from one another and so that would be much less likely to leak across this, this gap between the two. Uh, <clears throat> the trouble seemed to be that while there was no leakage between these two capacitors, the connection to them was uh, flaky. Um, and I've heard you know, and understand that this thing called silver disease, usually associated with the leakage paths, uh, this one wasn't so much like that as just intermittent connection inside this. There's nothing soldered to this or bonded to it. It's just clamped in there. It's like a crimp. And after all these years, uh, it's, it's just wore out. Temperature cycling, expansion, contraction. You can actually see, you know, you probably can't, but um, on, on the areas where the tabs, lugs, inside this can make contact with the silver dep uh, deposition on here are worn. They're worn through. Uh, holding it up to the light you can actually see light coming through where those, that contact was made. So for different reasons this capacitor, or these capacitors are shot. Another thing I noticed uh, with this, this capacitor, these both are the same size relative to one another. On this one they're not. One's bigger than the other one. No idea why they would do that. It, so it would make a difference which way they sandwich uh, this thing inside of here. Um, to look at the coils, they're identical. It seemed to, I can't count the turns, but uh, size-wise, volume-wise, they're, they're the same thing. So that's a little bit of a puzzle. Uh, don't need to explore that too much. But it was a clue and also in this can I was able to sneak the new capacitors inside the can there was plenty of clearance with this one not so much just because of the, the design of the thing uh, basically the, the uh, powdered iron adjustments the cores are external to the coils on this guy so that makes them big and they kind of go over the coil like that. Whereas on this guy, the coils here and slugs go in like that. So this this one has a lot more room in the can to install the capacitors. These these. Uh, this one did not. There's no trouble really. I prefer to have them in the can, just a matter of neatness and so forth. Uh, but they work just fine outside of the can, and so that's where they go. Uh, I did play around with a number of different values here. Uh, capacitance values. Uh, turns out what made what allowed me to get this thing peaked tuned in was uh, 82 picofarad here. That would be the smaller the smaller side, and a 110 picofarad here. Um, that puts the the tuning slugs about midpoint, which is where you want them. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, the thing tuned up oh, very well. The, the Q is through the roof. So that made a big improvement. Uh, there were some other things. Oh, I replaced this disc. It's a RMC, uh, Radio Machines Corporation, I think it is. 20%, uh, not very close tolerance. Uh, 47 picofarad, and uh, it's a temper co uh, temperature coefficient of N220. Um, 220 parts per million negative with uh, an increase in temperature, which isn't unusual uh, when using these to, to uh, complement coils such as this. This is the oscillator coil, AM oscillator coil. Um, it wasn't really a trouble, it was just kind of ugly and I thought, you know, we can make an improvement on this. And Plus I wasn't real happy with the span on the tuning. So I played around with it some and this is this is the position where this guy used to be major difference in quality now this does still work and I'm going to say that but not in this radio uh, I tried a 47 picofarad in here a silver mica dipped like this is it wasn't I got a little 
grief, not out so much grief. Um, I wasn't happy with the, 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 the span of the tuning. I wanted to go over uh, the band a little. So what I ended up in here is a 43. Now that's, that's not much difference, but it, it did, it did um, alter the, the span of the uh, tuning. So I can go below and above uh, the normal AM broadcast band. Bracket it. Uh, so there was that. So that was replaced. These the capacitor in here was uh, capacitors in here were replaced. But the source of the noise I was having, other than the home, that that was fixed up here with these electrolytics. Um, this made the replacing these gave me the warm and fuzzies about this coil that'll last a hundred years probably now, and this too. Uh, but the source of the noise was uh, resistors. Now, usually in these, the, the absolute value of the resistors is not critical. It can vary all over the place. and The radio will still function reasonably well. Um, it's, you know, it's why they put these cheap 20% uh, tolerance resistors in there. Uh, it doesn't matter a whole lot. This, this is 22K. 20%. So who cares if it's 15k or 30k? It's where it is in circuit. It's going to work just fine. The problem is, as they age, they get noisy, uh, especially when you've got uh, appreciable voltages across them or currents flowing through them. Um, it becomes an issue. <clears throat> uh, they develop cracks. They absorb moisture. And they get contaminated. Who knows? Various things that happen to them. So I went through and basically replaced every discrete resistor in it. And going back and looking at some of these, it, um, by the by, it did fix it. it. It no longer has any any noise at all. I've run it for hours and hours. Uh, the thing's fixed. I just wanted to go uh, describe a little bit about a little bit more about it and what I've done with it uh, to bring it back. Uh, just to, you know, to give an idea, set the uh, old meter here to measure resistance. Now, this particular one is in the power supply circuit. It's 1.5K, just like this guy. Uh, this is the one I pulled out. That's what I put in. This is used to part. It's recycled, but it's not in poor condition. It reads 1.58K. Well, that's way within spec. This is a 10% tolerance uh, resistor. But this guy um, we're supposed to be 1.5k plus or minus 10%, right? Well, that's reading 1.83k. A little high. Uh, that resistance would work just fine in that position in this circuit. The trouble is, is it stable? This especially when this thing starts to get hot. Uh, there is a reason why this resistor is large, right? It's got, it's got an appreciable current flowing through it a couple of watts. So, looking very closely at this thing, it's got some... look like cracks in the uh, molding. And, you know, clearly, the resistance is out of spec. 1.829K. Well, 10% that should read anywhere between 1.650 and 1.350. Uh -uh. That's he's gone. As I said, that, that that resistance will probably work just fine in there. Uh, but is it changing and moving around and making noise? That's the question. And yes, the I, the answer is yes. It, they do. So off he goes. And these others, similar situations with with some of these others. Uh, resistors I pulled out of here. Now here's one. Let's see. This guy was right here. Now what's in there right now? I put a, a 15 ohm. Pretty close. 15.4, 15.3 ohms. Um, in the power supply circuit, it's a dropping resistor. It's on the plate of the uh, rectifier tube. Well, what they had in there was this. Now that's a metal film flame proof resistor. Uh, probably mill spec, judging by some of the markings on it. This is a 10% 18 ohm uh, piece of crap. 
Um, what does this measure? Eight, 18 ohms, right? Plus or minus 20 percent. 24.3 ohms? Yeah, I don't think so. That should be anywhere between 19.8 and 16.2 ohms. Again, that that 24 ohms will work in there, but what's it doing? It, this thing gets hot, and the higher the resistance this drifts, the hotter it gets. Uh, the less power the radio is getting to its B plus line, so off with that. Oh, that's another one. This is a grid leak resistor, 6.8 mega ohms. Well, and it's a 20% tolerance, meaning 6.8 mega ohms, 20 plus or minus 20% value. Ah, uh, well. That should be, let's see, 8.16 to 5.44 mega ohms, right? It's 9 mega ohms, almost 10. Again, not so much a problem really with the value as if it stays still. Uh, I could put a 10 mega, mega ohm resistor in there and uh, nobody'd notice a difference. It's just a grid leak resistor. I could you know, probably put 22 mega ohms in there and you wouldn't notice much of a difference. Uh, but is this thing moving around or drifting? You know, it's, it's out of spec, so off it goes and I put a fresh one in there. Which, let's see what that guy reads. Yeah, 7.33, call it 7.33 mega ohms. Certainly uh, within spec. So, I did that with, with a number of these resistors, particularly ones that get hot. There was a, this guy here, this 150 ohm, uh, pretty sure he's in the cathode circuit of the uh, 50C5 here, the audio output uh, tube. What was in there? Look at this teeny weeny little piece of squirrely crap that they put in there. And this has enough current th uh, flowing through it to get hot. And it just, it, it zorched, it zorched it. Uh, 150 ohm resistor, right? Now that is 20% tolerance. 182 ohms. Well, it seems a little higher to me. Yeah, the highest that should be is 165 ohms. The lowest it should be is 135. Anywhere in there, I'm sure it would... would be fine and and this was functioning but is it moving is it drifting is it noisy probably it's 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 just aged beyond its useful life and it was really not of a high enough wattage to put where they did in the circuit it just you know, cheap they're cheap they want to make it so out that goes um, turns out the biggest problem that, that this radio had seemed to be, well, once I got all these capacitors and these coils uh, fixed up, uh, was this guy. He was microphonic. And ironically, it measures very close to its stated value. Certainly within 20%, within 10%, but you clicked on this, bang, 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 with that, you know, my normal pointer, uh, it was there. It was obvious. This thing um, is like a carbon microphone. It's a 22k, 20% uh, tolerance uh, resistor. Uh, what's it measure? Well, hell's bells. 21.33k. I'm not to complain about that, right? Wrongo. Uh, with the voltage across it, where it is in circuit, which is way up here in the front end, by the way. Um, it, it was a, a source of grief. Off with it. A couple of 470k 20 percenters, both within spec. Uh, but you get to the point where you're just going to shotgun this thing. I want this. I'm, you know, I want to be done with this. Would night. I would like to not have to revisit it as a component replacement trouble. Tubes, I don't mind swapping out and you know, things like that. But um, the occasional cleaning of controls. Uh, but they have to get in and replace uh, discretes like like these. 
I don't want to be bothered, and I don't think the, the next owner or owners of this would like to be bothered either, so all those off with them. Uh, these things are dirt cheap. I've got, I don't have to buy them. I've got vast stores of, of this stuff. Uh, as, uh, much of it uh, recycled, some of it salvaged from parts that were just considered uh, fully amortized and were just going to be tossed out. For example, this box of capacitors, these were going to, because of their age, uh, and where I got them, they were just no longer you know, useful. Uh, for them, uh, but they certainly do go a long way for uh, repairing and re you know, restoring these these old radios. Now, let's see what else. There's another aspect about this that I will show. I, I think I'll separate that into a different video, but I'll touch on it now. I mentioned earlier, I think, that this radio has a phonograph input into which you could plug the tone arm you know, pick up uh, into this. What they did for that, rather than have a switch that flips from uh, phono to radio, they incorporate that into the volume control here, the volume pot. Um, so uh, the phono input signal comes onto one end of the pot, the radio signal goes into the other end of the pot. The center, of course the wiper, is what feeds into the audio amplifier string. They put a center tap right in the middle and that essentially goes to circuit ground. So what that does is when this is an extreme radio volume down uh, position, it's phonograph volume all the way up position and likewise all the way to the other sides, radio volume all the way up, phono, phonograph volume all the way down. In the center is actually zero. So basically the wiper is grounded. Basically the input to the audio amplifier stages is, is grounded because of this tap. It's interesting they used a red wire. I would not have done that. Uh, that might have been changed. I don't know why, but that's in the circuit, that's that's uh, basically ground. So that's what they did. So this volume is uh, actually two volume controls in one. In the center, it's all the way down. To one extreme, it's phono phono input all the way turned up, and in the other extreme, it's it's radio turned all the way up. It's kind of cool. Um, so uh, once I get this thing buttoned up, it's back in the cabinet and. It's already been peaked. I'm not going to mess with that anymore. I did do it, it, you know, all a full uh, a realignment of this thing, and uh, it's quite a hot radio. It works very, very well. Uh, I'm rather surprised uh, here with no external antenna, just this uh, powdered iron or ferrite rod uh, loop stick in here. Uh, what this thing's able to get, uh, especially at night. Um, odd thing. Rather than use a shielded wire here for the phono input, now this wire passes directly over the uh, well, power supply, this, this is power supply, this is power supply, directly through those and directly over top of this 50C5, which is the audio uh, amplifier, the final uh, power amp. So that would need to be shielded, and what they did was they put this coiled spring over, over the, just a piece of wire, regular old wire. Uh, and it's only grounded at one end, which is basically two chassis. Um, this does work. I do have phonographs I could plug into that, but I'm really not so much interested in it. I have another interest in this input, uh, which I'll I'll show it once I get this thing buttoned up. So that's that's where it is. It's it's uh, I'm gonna call her. Repaired, just got to put the bottom cover on, uh, put it back in a, her, her uh, cabinet, you know, reconnect some things. Uh, it's already aligned, don't need to mess with that. All the tubes check uh, very, very good. Uh, in and out of the circuit. So, <laughs> we're going to move along with him or her and uh, button her back up and uh, have some fun with it. Maybe, uh, I think I will. Uh, post an, uh, another video.
uh, to that end.